program was uh, with me, uh, Tony Brown, and also Tom Donovan. Tom, first of all, you're welcome along to the program. Thank you, Tony. And uh, tonight, uh, or today, I should say, really, we're talking about are you confused whether I've met no man and no man night? Uh, we're going to talk about folklore. And actually, this is a good time to be talking about folklore because um, we're going up to the great Halloween. And uh, I suppose things in that connected with uh, with Halloween and with folklore in general. And I'd like to welcome along Sarah O'Brien. Sarah, you're welcome to the programme. Thanks very much. You're from Bally, as they say, and I've heard people call it Bally a Hill. Bally Ha Hill, Bally Ha Hill is the vernacular. I've heard it announced on local radio stations at Bally a Hill, and Lock Hill is another place near you. <laughs> <laughs> out there as well. Oh, La Hill, yeah. <laughs> there's some duties. And there's one in, out there in Newcastle West, only had it last week on a, on a station that should have known better, and they called it uh, Bella. Now, it is Bella uh, written, but it's pronounced as Balak. And uh, a fellow said, I and mean, in Bella, you know, and I thought he'd been local, he might have known better, you know. But anyway, that's not here, no, sir. Shelley, you're up in, in Mary Immaculate. Yeah, I am. I lecture in Mary Macleod College in Limerick. Um, it's where I did my undergrad and my PhD actually under Maura Cronin. Um, oh. And I specialised in oral history. And I, I was away from Limerick for a long time. I was, um, I suppose, studying and working internationally. And so it's really great to be back in Mary Macleod College again. It's such a found for um, for local history and international history. Uh, it's a really inspiring place to be working at the moment. Because all the students, Mary I, I never knew this Mary I, I always knew this Mary Mackler as a child growing up. Sorry, Tom, you said. No, sorry. What do, what do you lecture on? What do you specialise in, Sarah? So I'm teaching an oral history at the moment. I'm between, mm. I'm actually between um, the education and the arts department. Um, and so I look a lot at inclusive education and how we can sort of, I suppose, involve all of all of the children in the classroom, uh, including their backgrounds. And actually, I found that oral history, the techniques that we use in oral history, is it works really well for children as well, you know. So it's a lot about like teaching children how to listen to each other's life histories and, yeah. and draw them out and, and then develop empathy, actually. Um, and yeah. Is there is there an arch- is there an archive of oral history in Mary, in Mary Mecklet? Is there much like yeah. I, I heard like I've seen um, there was a man called Dineen from West, from a t- back near a tay, and there was a lot of interviews with him. Have you have you? Yes. Yeah. So th- there is an extraordinary archive uh, of oral histories in MIC. I think it's probably the most expansive in Ireland at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, we mentioned folklore and UCD Folklore Archive has a wonderful archive um, of textual do- do- and, and documents. But unfortunately, they 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 had to lose an awful lot of the, the actual, the oral uh, the oral text. But MIC, thanks to, to Dr. Maura Cronin, has built up an archive of oral over 3,000 audio recordings. Um, oh. So it, it's truly unique. Um, cool. It's unique for, for lots of reasons. It's, it's, there's a lot of local history there, but the way in which that archive was collected was, was really unusual because often it was students like myself being sent out to interview our grandparents or you know an old person down the road. And these are people who are often very familiar are intimate with and so what you get is um it kind of cuts through all the formality of academic history and you get this really naturalistic rapport and this kind of outflow of memory um and i think it's it's revolutionary in that it shines light on historic moments of history that are relevant to people that the kind of history that doesn't make it into the headlines you know so So what areas did it, did it cover? Like the school's manuscript in the late 30s went more into kind of, the, you know, they, they touched on local history, which is more folklore and sayings and that. So what, yeah. what's the archive covering? What areas? We were trained um, in an oral history method that, that was very much rooted in the person's own experience. So we were trained to allow them to go where they wanted to go. So this is one of the tr- tricky things when it comes to digitizing them because the themes are very subjective. But the way um, that Maura trained an awful lot of us was um, 
in the kind of the foregrounding of memory uh, at the beginning of an oral history project. So we would ask, and I still get my students to do this, you, you would ask people, can you tell me about three memories that are particularly vivid for you? And that get, get and so, so they might say something, you know, and often, you know, women will talk about the birth of their children or, you know, men, you know, the, the themes really vary depending on gender and life experience. But um, so it's very subjective. It's very open ended. But again, what you're, what you're getting is relevance, because so often as historians, we project things like the Civil War, um, as his, you know, we kind of we, we protect those aren't people as being historically important, but often there are local or personal or intimate things that are far more relevant to people. And we, we never get to audit that, you know, they're very difficult to get to. So that's that's the magic of the oral history collection. It's 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 absolutely uh, steeped in people's Excellent. lives. Yeah. yeah. What, what about accessibility? Is there any effort to put them digitize and put them online or? Yeah, so we're in the middle of a really big project on that front, actually. Um, the world of digitization of oral, of oral history has really um, developed dramatically in the last five years. So we've all been doing an awful lot of work in how, how to digitally index so that you can go to, for example, the middle of this interview and use a key term like uh, Ballyhaha oral history and then find it within the audio script. So... Um, it requires a lot of technical skills and we're we're currently applying to lots of different funding sources in Ireland and internationally to help us do that digitization process. Ideally, we want to make these accessible to, to researchers in the future and without even having to come on mm. campus. So we want it to be online. But as you'll imagine, there's also an awful lot of ethical protocols in place um, and GDPR. So, um, you know, every every audio interview within the archive comes with its own sort of, it, it dictates who is allowed to use it and, and how and why. So it's a very slow time consuming process in terms of making sure that we're treating these oral histories exactly as the people who, who provided them wanted them to be treated, if that makes sense. I know Tony's interested, Tony's interested in local history, so I'll let him come in. You know, but, uh, well, actually, first of all, um, it's your, I, I always term it as a race against the coffin, you know, mm. uh, to try to get information. Now, I have a huge archive, as Tom would tell you at home, mm. of uh, programmes we did for about, about nine years yeah. of uh, programmes, and I have all the tapes of all the programmes I did. Each programme went to over two hours, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also on top of that, there's an awful lot of them dead of the people that have died over the years. I could write, and the information I got out of them from mm -hmm. all aspects of, lo of life in, in villages and towns around the county, mainly in the county, but at times we got in people from outside, you know, that give us stories. But like that, there's so much there. And I, do, I did uh, have a meeting one time, but nothing came of it with Mara Cronin. And we got in, a lot of people from every area and area in the county. Do you remember that, Tom? Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was nothing ever, nothing ever came. I think there. that was, was that, was that aimed at Creameries? Or something? She was doing something in Creameries, I think, at one stage. Yeah, Maura did yeah. a great project in the Creameries. Well, we'll yeah. have, I'll have to follow up with you on that. Um, the problem with all of these things is resources. Maura is one of these, you know, superhuman people who was, you know, had, PhD students like me and massive classes like 400 students at any one time and she you know she drove single-handedly she drove the development of that centre so I think we're all aware now that it's there's there's time like there needs to be a greater team involved in you know in gathering them and uh, in digitizing and getting them up and going. Um, the, the great thing is that, you know, Maura Cronin was a pioneer in recognizing the value of oral history as, as you are yourselves. But in the last two years, we were suddenly seeing a new awareness of the power of oral history. And a lot of that has to do with the, the, the mother and baby homes and the Magdalene laundries and so on. And the sort of the disaster that emanated from the commission and the report has really heightened um, the particularity of oral history as an approach and the need for a very professional, very skilled approach to the collection of oral testimonies 
testimonies, especially when they involve very traumatic uh, events and so on. So, so one of the main criticisms of that commission was there was not an oral historian, somebody as skilled as Maura Cronin or another oral historian involved in both the collection of the interviews and, and, and the analysis of the interviews that was missing. So it does, out of this awful, terrible situation, it does feel like finally the words are kind of the argument that Maura Cronin has made around the need for oral history to be taken very seriously as a discipline seems to be filtering through the popular consciousness. And there's hope in that, you know. But does, so like, uh, I mean, OK, as bad not as that is and the injustice goes, there's far more people's ordinary lives need to be documented. Like, you know, I mean, we're in danger of just hitting the headlines and going for the dramatic events in people's lives. But I mean, you mentioned like creameries and things like the, the more mundane things in people's lives need to be recorded as well. You know, um, like yeah. we focus too much on the on the terrible past, you know, and uh, it becomes just a kind of a, a, a shock system like, where you're going to go for the, the, you know, so you need to to broaden it out. Like, I mean, there's five million people in Ireland like, and you have to look at all their lives and, and get a, a cross section, you know. I'm not saying to ignore the, the industry schools and the modern homes, but don't let it take over the whole folklore uh, oh, yeah. project. You know. So many other things yeah. that have been done, you know. There's yeah. lots of, you see, the, the different thing between the urban and rural. Whereas I'd be familiar now with urban problems that happen yeah. in the city. Uh, as regards housing estates, there's so much been lost out there. People that moved in the 40s, and I remember well in the 50s, and I'm old enough to remember, the 50s and what happened and as regards even in Killeen's and where uh, ba babies were buried within the city I know where they are you know and uh, for example when there was a project done on the on Mount St. Lawrence that I wasn't involved in but I tell you I knew a lot of things that they, they didn't know that are not in the book there was a book produced and it's a pity I wasn't consulted on that because I knew what the first burial was in the graveyard, and little things like that that could have been sorted out. Because I'm you old enough to remember that going to the to, to funerals in the city, whereas the county grave burials were different than the city burials. Yeah. You know, yeah. that you had traditions in the county that weren't Jews in the city, and then likewise there were things in the city that weren't Jews in the county. But having that's, said that, we could be yeah, that's something to the, the funeral tradition, like, uh, you know, and, and the difference, even within the county, there's different traditions in different areas, you know. I mean, yeah. leaving, the cof leaving the coffin outside the graveyard or walking around the graveyard, you know, and yeah. uh, that's an important factor as well. Pattern days between the yeah. county again and the city. There were pattern days in the city that weren't mm. recognised as pattern days, but mm. you had you had the May altars and that. And then in the county, you had wells, Whereas the wells, through urbanisation, the wells have disappeared. They're still there. I know at least about six holy wells that are not used anymore, which is a pity because mm -hmm. of, of, of urbanisation and the building and houses and that, you know. But that is, is gone. But having said that, Sarah, we're gonna, just as we, we're talking about, about Halloween, it's amazing with Halloween, at least some of the traditions, and again, there was a difference between the county and the city again, uh, with traditions in uh, in the uh, for Halloween, because in the city you had a bountiful load of nuts and things that you didn't really get in rural areas. You know that my aunt used to say that uh, guys gave up their girlfriends when the nuts were in the window. That was a tradition that a fella got rid of his, his girlfriend because it's going to come to Christmas and he had to buy her a present. So my aunt used to say the nuts are in the window. It's time to give up the girlfriend. And that's something our children don't understand because things I've said to my own grandchildren and even to my own daughters, I've told them things over the years. They were looking with their mouths open at me. You know, only yesterday a man told me now that he bought a, a, a barn rack and in it, he never knew that there was five items in the barn rack. He was mm. only focused on the ring. Mm. And we were put out of the room while my aunt was cutting the barn rack in case somebody, somebody was, could find out where the ring was. We were put mm. out of the room so that the ring wouldn't be exposed. But there were five other pieces. I, you're probably familiar with that. There were other things in the in the barn rack as well. And this friend of mine that rang me yesterday, he he never knew. He just thought it was a ring. No, I said, because he said he nearly broke his tooth on something solid. 
and it was a P. And yeah. I explained to him then where the P, how the P had come about, but he didn't know. He just thought, he thought it was just the ring that was in the in the barn back. But there's so many things. And as you said, burials really are the one that's, it's a pity there's so much been lost. Would you agree on that, Sarah? Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, what does, one of my favourite folklorists is Henry Glassy, and he has always said, one, one of the many profound things he said is, tradition is the creation of the future out of the past. Mm. And, and I tend to agree with that, in that um, tradition is always in a state of flux. And yes, certain things are getting lost, but new, but new things are also uh, coming on board. And I suppose I, 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 accept, I accept that, I accept that while you know, that it's a, it's a constant kind of, um, there are these new waves of traditions all the time that respond to maybe people's kind of lived experiences. And sometimes I wonder if we, um, if we're over nostalgic about the past, when the past is actually always in flux. Um, but I, 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 I do hear what you're saying. And I think we all feel that need to pass on um, traditions or rituals that were dear to us to our, our children and grandchildren. Um, again, I think I think the real loss for me uh, is our, is the the realms in which those stories and traditions were communicated. You know, so the sitting beside the fire, just the time to spend with younger people, talking to them about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think maybe that's that is what is endangered. Uh, yeah. As opposed to focusing on the ritual, I think it's focusing on the social practices that allow those rituals to be transmitted. If that makes but sense. How, how do you dis, how do you disentangle the nostalgia? You know, and the rose tend to, you know, look back. We know all our summers were fine. We never had rain. And I remember, you know, long summers of which when we couldn't save hay. So how do you? Yeah, Queen, people tend to re remember the good old days. You know. Unless you're Frank McCourt and he remembers nothing but the bad old days. So how do you, like, you could have somebody who's totally miserable and remembers nothing but bad. Like, how do you get a cross-section, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, I think this is where the world of memory studies comes in and actually can be very informative, you know? So there are things that we know about memory, like from psychology, that, um, that, that, uh, inform us that we, we do, we are rose tinted when it comes to early memories. In fact, Sigmund Freud had a theory of screen memories, which he said that we, we actually blank out any negative memories at all. And we kind of cover those with sort of lovely, warm, fuzzy, happier memories. And that's just a survival technique. That's, that's yeah. just what we do. So that may account for why the past seems so lovely. It's, it's just out of our own survival uh, instincts, you know? There's also, there's also something called the reminiscence pump, which is a term that comes from psychology. And it, it's, it's this period in our lives when we're, when we're young and sort of free, um, you know, kind of the period between 14 and 30. And we tend to lay down um, more memories in that period than in the rest of their lives. And so they're the memories that we kind of will go back to. And so they tend to have very positive associations. So psychologically, there's stuff happening that um, I suppose it leads us toward, toward a positive bias toward the past, you know. Mm -hmm. But also there's something, there's cultural memory. I mean, we we are primed by older people to remember things that were that were great. But but honestly, this is where like talking with women, um, older women about the past is really informative because there is a gender difference. And and women tend, I have found in my work. They tend to be less less nostalgic um, because often their lives were just so very difficult, and they are trying to testify to the difficulty of having ten children or, or, or you know doing all of the housework and the farm work uh, with very little support and so on. So I think um, you know opening up the field of history to include other voices that don't necessarily make it onto the record kind of helps to balance to neutralize 
some of that nostalgia as well. Mm -hmm. And well, you, you mentioned there that you went away from Mary High for a while. Um, did you, you travel, did you? I did. So I went after my PhD, I, I moved to Argentina. And I started a, an oral history project there that took ended up taking three years. And so I was interested in, you might know that there was there was a an, an migration movement from Ireland to Argentina in the mid 19th century. And so I was really interested in whether there was a kind of a, a, a living Irish identity in Argentina. So this was between 2010 and 2013. And, and the results were really fascinating. Um, it, 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 it was a completely different migration movement to what you see with the Irish in England or America. Mm. This is a community that um, saw themselves as being something of an elite migrant community in Argentina. Mm. There was kind of a myth, I would say, I would use the word myth, of, of, of kind of a very um, socially buoyant community they were associated with land land you know like owning vast tracts of land and doing mm. quite well and even you know even the nature of the interviews that I did there were very like I didn't need to coax people to be interviewed in the way that I had to when I was interviewing Irish immigrants in Birmingham mm. you know they're very proud of their Irishness very proud of being able to speak English um you know they were yeah they were a very they were a very proud community but um, as always with a world history, you start to get these layers that don't appear at the beginning, but slowly come out. So something, a, a major theme of the research became um, the effect of the military dictatorship. So from 1976 to 83, there was a very violent uh, military dictatorship in Argentina. And what I learned is the effect that actually had on, on the Irish, on certain Irish community members, especially those who were more liberal in their political beliefs. And there were, were some... They, were they pro or anti the junta? Well, like, were they against the junta in general? Or were they, you know, like normally you expect Irish people to be rebel? Yeah, rebel. yeah, exactly. You would. No, I mean, in general, uh, I would say the kind of the gatekeepers of the community were pro junta because they were yeah. land they were land owning they had a lot of interest that they they wanted to protect yeah. and so they would have been very anti peron and very anti kind of that that socialist um, yeah. approach um, but but of course you know communities are are disparate and there were there was actually quite you know that the Catholic Church, the Irish Catholic Church in Argentina, played an important role in in protecting subversive people who were being yeah. targeted by the military. And as a result, you saw two Irish Catholic churches in Buenos Aires being targeted in really horrific ways by the military dictatorship. There was one night in 1976 where five um, five priests, two priests and three missionaries, were murdered in the seminary. Um, attached to uh, St. Patrick's Church. And, and to this day, their families have never received uh, an answer for, for what happened, what happened to those family members. So it was, um, it, it was they, quite shocking. Did, really. did, the Irish community, did the Irish community have a connection with what, what Americans and Australians call the old country? Did they have a connection with Ireland or had they broken away completely from their relatives or their ancestors? <laughs> It's a good question. They were they were very informed about where they were from in Ireland. So most of them would say that they were, you know, and uh, you know, Westmeath and Wexford tend to be the the sites mm. of of migration. So they would be able to say, you know, I was from Mullingar. We were from outside Mullingar, Banlaquil, and so quite a lot of them had gone back yeah. actually to Westmeath, um, and they would, uh, you know, as a very educated community, they they would have done a fair bit of research and things like that mm. so but it depends on this doesn't it always just depend on the family you know yeah. some people yeah. maintain the link and and others don't but a yeah. huge um, emotional attachment to ireland was extraordinary absolutely mm. extraordinary right. even if yeah. the, the kind of the, the living links were gone and how long were you in argentina i was there for three years all right 
So I had to learn Spanish um, to to actually do the research. And Mm. uh, and it took, it's a, I mean, it's such an enormous country. So it took me so long to get out to the Pampas, which is where most Irish um, families settled. And, you know, it could take six hours to get from one village to another. And then you're trying to find people. So the research took a really long time, but it was fascinating. I have some names there, and there any of them survived? Oh, huge, yep. And double barrel surnames, actually. So what you found with the Irish is that they tended to, to marry each other. They were in, really encouraged to marry each other by the, by the Catholic Church. Uh, so very endogenous community. So there was a lot of people with surnames like Murray Brown, you know, and uh, they great pride in having a double barrel surname and there was towns that I went like there was a town that I visited in the pampas called O'Brien there's another one called Duggan you know so they're named after um very wealthy landowners yeah O'Brien O'Brien was named after you no no it wasn't me no no (laughs) no relationship (laughs) (laughs) was it a a term for the Irish is it was it a uh, is it gauchos or something? Or um, it- so, a ga- it's funny that you relate those now. A gaucho in Argentina is okay. like the, it's, yeah, okay. it's like a cowboy, an agricultural yeah, worker. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the the term for Irish in Argentina is Irlandes, Irlandes Argentino. And they'd always say Irish Argentine, you know, it's, it's double barreled at this, mm. uh, at this point. But, um, like, the gaucho is kind of the, the emblem of Argentine masculinity, yeah. I would say, you know, it's kind of, you know, the way that America has the cowboy, Argentina yeah. has the gaucho. And what you see at the beginning is, um, the, you know, the Irish were very suspicious of these kind of gaucho nativo, as they call them, native characters. But by the 20th century, you kind of see how they, they become almost quite... Um, I wouldn't want to say the word envious, but they, they begin to aspire to a lot of those qualities of the gaucho. But there's also a lot of similarities. I mean, they're both agricultural workers. Yeah. Um, very, the gauchos are very good with horses. They're, you know, they're hardworking, they're ruddy and so on. So you begin to see how the Irish, um, like I say, start to aspire to those qualities of the gaucho. Uh, and they, they do seem to mesh. In, in certain ways, but, you know, one of the things that I found in the research was there, there was a certain um, need or desire for distance within the Irish community in Argentina because of their race and ethnicity. They did see themselves as different uh, and maybe superior. Um, and, of course, that is fed by racist discourses around what it means to be white in South America. Yeah. So there was a lot of interesting stuff or uh, values and beliefs around and race and whiteness and things like did, that. that you did you to. travel did you travel to any other countries in South America? Oh I did, yeah. So my hmm. my I spent I spent six months. I started in Mexico and backpacked hmm. my way down through Central and South America. I spent a oh, long okay. time in Peru um, hmm. where I taught English for a while and that's where I really learned Spanish. Um, so hmm. I I got yeah I got to go through a lot of South America. Wow, well, yeah. You didn't have to get to Machu Picchu, did you? I did. I got to Machu Picchu. I yeah. To Machu Picchu. Yeah. I yeah. Come yeah. We're, we're like a travel agency, and then we're going away from from yeah. customs. Did you find anything? I'm just curious again now, as regard, did anybody have anything a custom that you would attribute to Ireland? In other words. Um, was there any burial rites that they would have mm-hmm. taken from home, or, or was there anything at all as regards sayings that you came across or, yeah. from Ireland? That's a really good question. Well, you already mentioned the funerals, and the funeral custom was um, was something that was carried through. So, um, not so much. Yeah, they did, they wouldn't have used the word wake. Now, I wouldn't have heard that used, but kind of. Um, the but they would have talked about the funeral as being an important you know moment saying the rosary in english uh, remained a really important tradition for a lot of families so at night i mean obviously these are fourth generation irish argentine so their native language is spanish but a couple of families told me that you know every night they'd all lead down lead down around the floor and say the rosary in english yeah. um, so that was quite quite a powerful custom 
Um, things like sports to a certain, like they have a hurling club in Buenos Aires, but they tend to play more more rugby there. Um, you know, Irish style. Actually, for, for women, um, cooking, like recipes are really, really important as, as vectors of tradition. So um, in Argentina, it's a very beef eating country, but Irish women talked about how they would make scones or roast chicken. And that, that helped to distinguish them as kind of Irish families and tea, like drinking tea was something that they still associated with their Irishness as opposed to mate, which is like a, a green a green tea that you drink through a straw. They would have friends over and drink tea, tea with milk, which would be unusual for for America, for, for Argentina. So yeah. I, I actually found that women again, were almost more equipped through their gender roles to actually be the purveyors of tradition in Argentina. And you know? when, when, when did they emigrate? What, you know, decades did they emigrate? And what, why did they pick Argentina, do you know? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So the movement is, it, it's in a way, it's very siloed. It begins um, in around the 1840s and it ends very quickly in 1889. And there's a reason for that. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But why did they pick Argentina? It seems that they were essentially recruited. So at the time, the, the British Empire was expanding in Argentina. They were building railroads. They, they yeah. saw the agricultural potential of a place like Argentina. Um, it's quite a dark history, really. They, they wanted to clear the, the land of indigenous and make this a very agricultural productive area. Mm. So what the Argentine um, government together with the backing of the British Empire decided was that they would build these railways, these infrastructure systems and develop farming. And so they began to recruit farmers in England, in Wales uh, and in Ireland to go out and to, to settle the land. So what you see is advertisements appearing in, in the more agriculturally prosperous parts of Ireland, recruiting people to go out. And so that's why you get people from, and they wanted sheep farm, people with um, experience of sheep farming in particular to go out there. Um, so it seems to have been very much coordinated by the Catholic Church as well. There was a priest called Father Fahey, and he used his networks in Ireland. And it seems that they almost handpicked the families that they wanted to go. So they didn't want it to be like, kind of the free for all that you had in America where very traumatized famine victims were moving out. They, they didn't want any of the association of poverty and neglect. So this tended, they tended to be the sons and daughters of middle, middle range farmers. Yeah. So yeah. they, they weren't the most just destitute at all. Uh, yeah. And it seems that they were kind of handpicked by local priests and, and sent off. And then that developed into chain migration patterns. So you kind of whole villages going out following each mm. other. Um, they were very quickly collected in the port of Buenos Aires by this priest uh, who didn't want them to be corrupted by the city and kind of swept out to really like harsh um, environments in the Pampas. There was no infrastructure really at all. It's, it's very difficult to know how they survived. And, you know, a lot of people suffered and, and died. Uh, especially women in childbirth and that isn't something that isn't acknowledged like uh, talking about focusing on on the good but I found that there was actually an awful lot of really awful stories that um, and, and, and terrible stories of sacrifice that kind of were under the surface do you know what I mean so that's why that's why they went out there and they tended to do quite well so they had a system where they they might have a flock of sheep and then at the end they'd get their pay and they'd be able to take one tenth of the flock and they they there was a system where they could then develop by their own land you know mm. uh, so so very quickly you see kind of an, a land owning elite emerge in Argentina that you don't see in America and so on but why does it stop then in 1888 what, there, was, there was this disastrous event um, known as the Dresden affair in 1888 and. At, by this point, um, the gates to Argentina were open, so there was a lot of Italian and Spanish immigrants kind of flooding in because it was seen as kind of a new global power. Um, mm. 
And it seems that some sort of conniving entrepreneurs, businessmen, sort of did a big recruitment campaign for Irish immigrants to go to Argentina. They got this really hokey uh, ship called the Dresden that wasn't fit for purpose to take them out there. And they promised them, you know, land and jobs. And it seems that they picked up any kind of very destitute Irish people who weren't equipped for the journey. So they landed in Buenos Aires and were essentially homeless. And this was, you know, this was a social crisis for established Irish communities in Argentina. They were very aware of how stigmatized the Irish were in America, and they were very, very protective of their reputation. And so they absolutely did not want a situation where suddenly they were associated with the poverty and neglect and kind of lower working class status Mm. of the Irish in America. So they kind of, they stopped the migration movement at that and and um, a couple of archbishops come out and said that nobody should be going to Argentina anymore. In reality, the accumulation of land at that point was 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 essentially saturated. So I think yeah. there was a sense that they didn't, there wasn't, they couldn't have, they couldn't really absorb too many yeah. more without it becoming a kind of a free for all. So it does, it, to a certain extent, it's a very elite movement. It's very, very socially monitored and protected. Yeah. Was there any Limerick, did you come across any Limerick uh, families there? Um, not too many. No, I can't think off the top of my I thought, head. I thought a few from Billy Hale might have got out to. <laughs> I think I was the only one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it tended to be yeah. Wexford, Westmeath, oh, yeah. some from Cork, very yeah. few from Limerick. You mentioned earlier on there, which is something I would object to. You mentioned the Irish with roast chicken, right? I would dissociate that because to me, roast chicken is something that only came into Ireland in the, in the 60s. You know, mm. I never remember roast chicken when I was a child because mm. uh, it was never, they were never <laughs> I'm sure the children wouldn't believe that now. You know, you would be mm. like Kentucky chicken and things like that. But roast chicken wouldn't really have come into Ireland until till I, I didn't go so far as to say the late 60s and into the 70s. You know, yeah. like, and, and, and the farms, though, like, I, I, we had roast chicken because we we yeah, killed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 these are rural people, so they probably had the same thing, you know. Uh, so that's this is where the the, the urban urban rural divide comes in. Like, yeah. you know. the city, <laughs> the city, yeah, the city was a thing for the the butcher where you got a ro- you got roast beef or corned beef or so you know from the butchers for Sunday, and every other day in the week. Like when you had stew, stew and fat chicken. You're you're lucky, Tony, because if you had if you had smelt the chicken as it was prepared, being killed and prepared like I did, no. you have to turn you off roast roast chicken no. for life. I, I hear what you there. Milk, milk for me just comes out came out of a bottle, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we never questioned where things came from, you know. But, we just but, 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 but Sarah, just to go back to the folklore there. Did you see much differences collecting folklore in? Well, obviously there would be an Argentina. But I mean, from you were saying they were more open in Argentina to it being interviewed. Um, yeah, that had more to do with the social position of being Irish in Argentina. Oh, so yeah, they felt yeah. very proud of it. Whereas my PhD was um, interviewing Irish immigrants in Birmingham. And it was very, it was very difficult. It was very contentious. And, you know, you can, the word trauma is bandied around a lot at the moment. Um, but you could tell that this is a community that was very traumatized by 1974 bombings and, mm. and just a general stigmatization. You know, they just, they were a community that kept their, you know, a suspect community or a community that kept their head down. And just talking about Irishness was for something that was really difficult for a community who, you know, were so made to feel so threatened by their Irishness, you know. Right. But um, no, I I know that the, the theme is folklore, and I want to be able to give you something on that. Um, it it goes away from my Irish migration thing, but I um I was working on a really interesting project this summer, and I, I'm not sure if you heard about the, um, some controversy about a new sculpture that was to be put up in Innistimon called the Puka of Innistimon. Did you hear about okay. that? Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So, so that was something that interested me, me and I'm living in County Clare right. now. Is, is it a poker as in divorce? Is it a poker yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Massive, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so essentially um, a tender had gone out for a piece of work, a, a public sculpture to be put up, and um, the, the, the piece of art that won the tender was um, like a six-foot statue called the Puka of Innes Diamond. And very quickly, this is an early May, um, a lot, uh, there was a huge amount of media coverage about how the locals had rejected this puka and rejected the sculpture. And so mm. that piqued my interest. I was interested in why, what was going on there, uh, because the media um, kind of portrayed it as a rejection of folklore and of that thing we were talking about earlier, where people have forgotten their past and they're disengaged from folklore and so on. So I started an oral history project on it, actually. I, I started interviewing people. Um, and for me, it really helped to understand the the particularity of folklore and what folklore means to different people. And so, um, you know, in a style and like most of North Clare has, has a really, you know, incredible artistic and folkloric history, you know, and they've very particular folkloric history. And so what I felt or what I found is that people were saying, look, the puka is grand as a kind of a, an entry level folklore, you know, the kind of thing that you tell tourists or children. But they were like, but we, we have a very, you know, they, they have a very authentic folklore that's particular to their region. So I heard a lot of stories about the Coach Devour, which was um, like a carriage that would be seen going yeah. up to somebody died or, or, you know, local mythical stories, you know, but that were real, very authentic and of the place and real to them. And so they felt that this you know, kind of a big statue of a puka was, you know, uh, Benedict Anderson has that book, um, sorry, no, Eric Hobbs book, The Invention of Tradition. And so they felt like this is something that's being kind of a, a very entry-level form of folklore that was being projected onto them, you know. They, they find it a leprechaun, leprechaunish type of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They said, look, that's grand for the Leprechaun Museum up in Dublin. But yeah. like we we actually take our history and our folklore very seriously. And I suppose you almost want to feel seen and represented. Um, and yeah. it was an extraordinary study, you know, because and like it shows me how mm -hmm. how particular and how sophisticated uh, everyday people's understanding of folklore is, you know, we won't just take mm. anything. We're not just going to say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll take that. You know, people, and and it was an awful lot about memory as well, because, um, you know, as I was going through, you know, going through with participants, um, what, what we realized is that the location where they were they were planning to put that Puka sculpture had been very important um, or it was, I suppose it was a site of memory, especially for the War of Independence. So as you probably both know, Innes Diamond was burnt down um, in geez, about 101 years ago in September mm. by, by Crown forces in retaliation uh, mm. for attacks. And so the, those there, there are locations within that town that people associate with, with the torture and murder of, of local people. And so there's, um, and that is not, a, it's not, it's documented orally, but but it is it but the place is kind of the museum for those memories and so there's a fear then that if you start adding historical images like the puka those kind of more authentic real histories that actually happen get get lost you know so mm -hmm. and, and i found that to be you know i found that very humbling and that made sense to me you know that there is a a protection you were talking about tradition earlier but there was a need yeah. to protect what was valuable what was undocumented but what people communally shared and that's culture and memory isn't yeah. it but it's good it's good that people um objected i'm not too sure what happened but like north clare has a great tradition in folklore and but i'm sure there's other areas that the, the poke could be up a few years before anybody noticed you know uh yeah i think i think that it's good like the people are choosing now I think there's a, a, a in the last number of years there's an over proliferation of um, monuments to. I know my friend Tom Dummy will give out to me about this, but an over -pro proliferation of monuments towards Republican victims, you know. And um, like I'm not going into the the uh, whole RIC comm commemoration mm -hmm. or anything, but you know um, there needs to be it needs to be broadened out. There's lots of other issues like 
you know, drowning tragedies that can be commemorated rather than just, you know, the more recent, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned there a while ago, just a funny story comes to mind. You mentioned the coast, coast of Bow. I interviewed a man, which I have on tape, he's long dead now, Tom Mack, and he lived out near Lacor. And he said one night in one of the interviews I did with him that he heard the coast of Bow coming up behind him and he turned it, he turned it into the fence, into the field so that he wouldn't look. And I accused him of being drunk. He was coming. <laughs> he was coming up in the pub. He got very annoyed with me. He did. He said that he did hear it coming up behind him, and he was afraid. I, thought, to him, you know? I, I, I had a, I had a man in Glen Tony, and um, he he kind of half explained it that yeah. um, the Kitchener family who lived in Ballygoclin near Glen uh, yeah. pro, pro, uh, banned bur burials in the graveyard in Kilmorley graveyard because they owned the land and they stopped. They wanted to stop people going down through the land to bury and. He said that they, they used to put mufflers on the on the horses' hoofs, bags of sand, and and put a, a hood over it so it wouldn't snort in the in the wind, uh, or in the at night time to make noise. And he said that's what the head. He said, he reckons that's what the head is. He saw it going by, but it was a, a hood over the horse's head, and right. so it wasn't it wasn't a, a curse of our as such. But he said he could explain why where the the stories came from, Story and then again. From and I, I mix that with a drop of protein, and you have yeah, you have lots of yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned wakes as well, Sarah. They were never really what, what I would class as traditional wakes now in the city. Hmm. The body, which is still, would you believe, when we saw one this morning, well, saw one and noticed that people were laid out in their in the rooms, okay, hmm. as opposed to going to a funeral parlour, but. It was just there, and the rosary would be said. And I've attended a few a few rooms like that, that in the city where there was never a wake where we'd, you'd have a key knock, or, you know, and, and uh, there was never we hadn't got that era uh, that there was nothing like that in the in the city. Mm -hmm. There was never a tradition to start kind of let's say low key where people would come to the house, visit the house for two hours or three hours. The rosary would be said at a given time, and then everybody would leave. But there was mm. never any merriment or singing and dancing mm. or anything like that in the city. That was really a rural thing now. I'd never had the And would they be would that ceremony that you described be referred to as a wake or just as if yeah. it was? Yeah. The body was yeah. being was the yeah. same. What time is the wake at? Mm -hmm. And when I was a child, I didn't know what a wake was. My aunt would bring me out to somebody's house and you know, and you got, I remember you touched the body, and I didn't feel like doing that, you know. But um, I, have a, I, have a no, I, have a, I have a notebook, Tony, of my grandfather's wake and the stuff that was bought at the local shop, uh, and buckets of porter and, and snuff. So, you know, the expression snuff, um, got thrown on like snuff away. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was a big occasion, like, so you, you bought in the porter and the, you know, and they made sandwiches and the whole lot. Like, it, it was like a, a a festive occasion, like you know, especially for especially when an old person is celebrating their life more than you know, and people see it as oh, you know, they're celebrating death, but they're celebrating the person's life rather than celebrating the death, I think, anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah I suppose, but there's never, as I said, it's, it's amazing the difference between the city, I would think, anyway, because there's things that I've learned over the years talking to people from the county on the history program that I never knew existed. I learned a lot about the county. And then, likewise, yeah. I could tell them about things that happened in the city. But that was mm -hmm. never really, well, well, until the funeral parlors came in, it stopped a lot of it, really. Mm -hmm. The people went to the funeral, and it stopped. It's like weddings, the same with weddings, that you had a wedding, as was called a wedding breakfast, because mm -hmm. as you probably know, everybody got married early in the morning. And then when the, when the, when the hotels, because in a house, you could go out for two days in a house, whereas the hotel, you went to the hotel and you got shot of it, in other words. It was finished by four o'clock in the day. Now I know that they're going on until two in the morning. But that time, the wedding breakfast was in the hotel at about 11 or 12 o'clock. And you had some fun in the afternoon, but you were finished and got home by seven o'clock or eight o'clock. There was nothing dragged on. But the same thing, the hotel was able to care for that. This, as I said, the same with the with dead house. And, so on. Yeah, and that's another thing that's gone, the dead house. You just heard of, I remember in the city home now over, and actually in the maternity hospital, which they demolished only about 10 years ago, there was a dead house. 
the maternity hospital in Limerick, uh, on the on the, the Belfield side, and there are houses built on that now because again they stopped going into a dead, dead house. I think Sarah Sarah will have to start a new um, for, uh, oral history mm. project with you, with you, Tony. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, there's something to be, I mean, Maura Cronin and Helene Bradley have done, um, just published a book about shopping in Limerick and yeah. the kind of the rituals around messages and things like that. But there is, it is I do agree that it's it's interesting, the, ver- the rituals that have to do with the urban world that, mm. you know, they, they're so distinct, you know. Um mm. Yeah, that no, absolutely. There's there's so much richness in it, you know, and there's a there's great richness in. Yeah, sorry. No, the things have been have been forgotten about in the city because the city exp- is expanding so fast. There are new children coming up. I mean, I've gone to schools with children, and they're looking at me with their mouth open. Even simple things like there'd be no television, you know. And the usual question is, what did you do? <laughs> you know, mm. you, you played games. You played played cards, as my aunt used to call it, the devil's prayer book. But mm. like that, you, you do these things in the city, and they can't understand how you could do it. Because in the countryside, I'm but, sure to agree that mm. on a summer's evening, you had fields, you had animals, but you didn't have that in the city. So mm. you were kind of stuck, you know. Well, I, heard rec- I heard recently where a school is introducing, teaching junior infants how to play, because yeah. they're not... They're not capable of interacting, you know, because the yeah, TV they and games, they, 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 they haven't, they, they can't play games, even board games or, you know, so. Well, I mean, yeah, play-based learning is like a whole philosophy of yeah. teaching where it's not so much of teaching them how to play, but it's actually recognising that play is really imaginative and that yeah. you can get an awful lot out of children while they play whereas play with before was th- something that adults sent children off to do whereas now there's an understanding that if you are an adult if you're with them while they're playing you're able to access so much of what's going on in their worlds and their minds and kind of build on that and it's yeah. almost like you're you're building in naturalistic educational opportunities into their place so that they don't even realize that they're learning they're playing you know so yeah. it's kind of much more it is much well, it's more holistic, but it is recognizing that you know that's well, children's well, work. T- t- Tony and myself have often discussed this here now. Like the like when I grew up, we had one particular teacher, Bernard Stack, and he was um, in- innovative in his own way, and he used to send us out looking for quern stones and different things, and we especially in bogs and when we we're plowing, and we'd bring in. And he set up a museum in the school. And like mm. we we were learning history, and we didn't know it. You know, we're just yeah. like and like you say. It was kind of a fun based, yeah, you know, rather, yeah. Rather than, open, rather than opening up a textbook and going yeah. through, about and it's this, amazing you know, that you still remember that, even you know, they're yeah. the things, they're the learning, it's accidental learning that sticks in your memory, yeah. you know, and yeah. it's kind it's the kind of learning that transforms you, you know, it makes mm. you look at the world in a different way. And I suppose that's you know, with my education students, that's what you're trying to give them the confidence to well, do. I, I, I blame him for this course of history, this, the course uh, of the, yeah. yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> I know. Well, we've yeah. all had one teacher that has been yeah. so influential, no, like their own. I, mean, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that. No, I hadn't really. No, mm. I didn't learn anything about local history. We never, see in the city again, we never learned the national anthem. Mm. I never knew the national anthem. You know, when it's in rural schools, you heard it. Uh, I never knew. I always thought in the city, the, the Irish flag was always tasked as green, white, and gold. Mm. And I believed it was green, white, and gold up to about, I suppose, 30 years ago. I'd never heard of orange. Never heard. You heard about the six counties. You heard about, of course, being from Limerick, you heard about Sean South. Never knew what he actually was believed in. You just heard that he went up and he was shot. Never heard the flag of saw handling. Nothing like that. And like that, this, the whole thing was different in the city to the county. Mm. Never heard about famous... Uh, I never heard of Yates till I was about 40, I'd say. Never mm. heard of any writers or anything like that. You learned a bit of poetry, OK. He's, pro- but, he's, he's probably still banned when you were going to school. <laughs> well, it could have been, you know. <laughs> the Christian brothers, all these Christian brothers, to me, I remember, had kind of country accents, because they were all... Mm. <laughs> they were yeah. from the you know, and I remember that the way they used to talk. We had lay teachers as well, 
But mainly because I, I, I learned very little. Had well, we, we'll, have, we'll have to do another program with Sarah on the... On top of folklore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, yeah. I've taken up too much of your time now. Oh, so no, it was, no. It was really yeah. fascinating to listen to your you're, insights. You're, 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 you're working, Sarah. We're only oh. uh, idling. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks, Sarah, thanks, so much. Sarah. thanks so much. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks Take care.